Hey, welcome back to the studio. This is my day of play. We had four crazy interviews today, starting off with Brandon Butler, who's out of Atlanta. This man has a connection to the community as well as culture, and his podcast really is extremely entertaining as well as educational. And then we spent some time with Roseanne Perry. Roseanne Perry has written a book about so many different animals. This this new one is about horses, wild horses, the Pony Express. Yes, it's a young adult read, but man, I'll tell you what, she really gets into storytelling when it comes to animals. Caramo. Are you familiar with Caramo? What a powerful, positive person. And they're headed into their third season for the daytime talk show. And then we wrap things up with a real rocker, Mr. John Karabi from Dead Daisies. Talk about a man that was not afraid to really let us inside the production studio to create their brand new album. This is my day of play, completely 100% unedited because I don't believe in hiding behind curtains. You get the full experience from beginning all the way to the end. So just before 40, about 20 minutes and uh there's arrow hey arrow hey what's going on you guys i'm home today as you can see <laughs> i was in the office yesterday anyhow uh, uh brandon butler is here you'll have 20 minutes good morning brandon how are you doing today Hey, Errol, good morning. I'm great, man. How about you? Absolutely excited to talk with you because there's one thing that I am picking up on every one of your episodes of this podcast is that you're saying there is culture in this country, that there are several different layers and levels, and we can all learn from them. We are not the same people. And I just love the way that you go into those cracks saying, hey, let's talk about it. Yeah, you know, absolutely, man. I, mean, I think one of the things that people don't always remember is, you know, in just the country, America in general, you know, our biggest export is pop culture. Yep. You know, pop culture travels very well. You know, you can see the influences of America all around the country. And then in Atlanta specifically, you know, we kind of say our biggest air export down here is culture as well. We have this saying that Atlanta kind of influences everything. And, you know, when you look around, you just see all these different moments where, whether it's music or sports or TV, like there's just something down here that's brewing that just inspires people all over the world. And so for us, you know, that's what kind of Butternomics is about is it's finding those, those pockets of interesting culture, but also people that are like using business to, to build things at that intersection and showcasing them on a national stage because we feel like there's a lot of hidden gems down here yep, in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we watch Atlanta. I'm up here in Charlotte. I mean, you're our evil twin sister down there in Atlanta and we, you, you can keep <laughs> Spaghetti Junction all you want. We don't need that up here. No, you know what? We 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 love it so much we're building another one down no. here. Get ready. You know, I was I was I was stuck on Spaghetti Junction last night. And, you know, that's one thing about Atlanta, man. You never know. I was I was on my way home last night at about ten o'clock and I ran into gridlock stop traffic. I thought I was back God. in LA for a second. So you, you don't want any parts of that. The way that you get into your conversations, I would love to know how you show prep because you do it so naturally, especially your conversation with Jay Carter. I realize you guys have known each other for a long time, but but the idea of a podcast was brand new for you at that point in time, and you just went through it so smoothly, talking about you know how, how he wasn't interested in going for the big names necessarily. He just wanted to have a successful festival. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of that obviously is a relationship. You know, I've known Jay for, you know, 15 and almost yeah. 20 years. And that's one of the beautiful things about Atlanta is a lot of us, you know, we all have kind of met each other and known each other just over the years organically. Um, I actually, when I, you know, in a previous life, you know, I actually helped him do the marketing for his very first one music fest. And so it's just been an amazing, um, you know, thing to kind of watch, uh, you know, how that's grown into this, you know, huge, you know, cultural moment. But yeah, man, you know, a big thing with me with just, you know, show prep and just getting ready is I'm going to tell you a little secret, Arrow. I always wanted to work in, you know, radio and broadcasting. And so for me, um, I'm really appreciating these opportunities to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. I really try to kind of dig in and um, go a little bit deeper than the whole. So how would you start and what inspired you? Because I know for a lot of these people, too, you know, they're not really in the beginning stages. They're kind of at the advanced stages of what they're trying to build. And those stories don't always get told. You know, we talk a lot about when people want to start something or how they raise money or, you know, how they got the idea, but nobody talks about kind of that messy middle of business <laughs> when you're kind of in years, you know, three, five, 10, and you're kind of, you know, you, things are going well, but it's not as sexy as it was in the beginning when you were launching. And so that's kind of the idea behind Butternomics is to kind of bring out some of those stories to give people some, you know, tactical kind of advice and really kind of give them something they can take away and hopefully apply um, to when they start reaching that level as well. You must be reading my notes because one of my questions for you was, you you are a solid backstage pass to the authentic world of making connections beyond the first step. 
Yeah, you know, I think for me, I, I kind of look at that, and I like I like how you wrote that. I'm going to have to use that, a solid backstage pass. I like that. And, <laughs> and you know, for me, I've, I've run businesses before. Um, I've been on kind of all sides. I've been an entrepreneur that's run brands. Um, you know, I've been on the corporate side as an executive. And so I've kind of seen it at multiple different levels, and I'm able to kind of, you know, dance in between both of those things and have those conversations. And so, again, on Butternomics, you know, we're going to bring on not just entrepreneurs, but there are a lot of amazing people that are working in the corporate space that are doing things yeah. and building things and making a difference. Um, and I want to kind of showcase that as well, because it's not just about, you know, building something from scratch, you know, sometimes because entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And there are a lot of amazing people that are inside, you know, companies and organizations that are also making a difference and also making an impact in culture. And I, again, I want to showcase all those people, but, you know, using my experience and my background, um, I want to kind of bring out some of those hidden nuggets and gems that sometimes get missed over. You know, one of the things I kind of talked about with uh, the people on the show is, look, I, I'm sure you've done a million interviews before. And I'm sure there's, a, I'm, I'm sure you've told the story of how you've gotten started over and over and over yep, again. I yep. always ask them, what do you want to tell? Like, what story <laughs> have you not gotten opportunity? What are some of your greatest hits that you've never gotten out there? And that just makes them light up because they get to talk about something that is new and important to them. And it's always just an amazing conversation. See, my favorite part is when when they talk about when it's when it's time to step to the edge of that cliff and step off to break free of the corporate life and to build their own brand. That's where I find inspiration. Yeah, and I think a lot of people find that too because a lot of people feel that same way. And I mean, I'm telling you, man, it's scary. Like yeah. a lot of people don't fully realize, you know, what it's like to go out there and, and really have to be 100 percent responsible for you know making it work out. And then even even more beyond that. You know, when you do get success and all of a sudden now you start having employees and people that also depend on you for their livelihood, like nobody talks about those stories. Nobody talks about, you know, what business owners go through, um, you know, when again, they have a team that they're also responsible for and it's, and it's not just them and them trying to kind of hustle along. And so, you know, that's an amazing, I always say, it's kind of like, um, you know, standing on that cliff. There's a, there's a great book by Seth Godin called The Dip. And he kind of talks about this idea that in the beginning of it, yeah, you're kind of on this cliff you know, kind of looking over this valley. And while you're on that cliff, everybody's celebrating you. You always say, you know, think about when you get ready to graduate high school, or you get ready to start a new business. You have all these people saying, oh, that's so amazing. I'm so proud of you. And then you have to step off. Yeah. And now you're in that valley. Now you got to do the work every single day. And it's not always sexy. It's not always cool. And nobody sees that work. But you know what? On the other side of that valley is what are your goals and your dreams and what you want to accomplish and the only way to get there is to kind of go through that middle. And so, you know, part of Butternomics is identifying that a lot of these people are in that space. You know, again, they've, they've launched their business, you know, five, 10, you know, years ago. And, you know, they're well beyond the, I have an idea phase. Yeah. You know, now they're in the, okay, how do I go from this level to the next level phase? And I think that's, again, a stories that people really need to hear more of so they can kind of understand what to expect and also learn from it. And so maybe they, you know, either avoid that situation themselves or they're able to, you know, deal with it a little bit differently when they have a, a similar thing come up in their life. When it comes to worth, one of the things that I found very inspiring on your podcast was the fact that you talked about those moments where you don't feel worthy. And, and those are very big teaching moments because we all go through that. We're, we're going, oh, I'm, I, I made a mistake. I, I, I feel bad today. And it doesn't matter what the success is. If you go by the numbers, you die by the numbers. But you really do put focus on that, that moment of silence. Yeah, man, look, one thing I've learned over my career, and I'm going to tell everybody that's listening, this is the truth. A lot of people are just making it up as they go along. Yep. <laughs> you know, some people some people do a better job of others than hiding it. But I think, you know, when people start to realize that more, that whole idea of imposter syndrome is really just, you know, your mind playing tricks on you. You know, you have to really believe that you're worthy. You have to really believe that, you know, you can accomplish these things and that anything is possible. That's the beauty of you know, where we're at right now, even from a time um, and just in history. You know, in the past, if you wanted to start a business, you were kind of, you know, relegated to just your local area. Yep. You know, it was really hard to kind of make it, you know, national or global. And now because of the internet and social media, you know, not only can you build a global business, but you can build a global team. You know, the best people might not necessarily be in your local area. And so, the you know, the internet and social media allows you to go out there and find, you know, who's the best graphic designer in the world that I can afford to work with that might want to, you know, believes in what I can do. And so that's why, again, it's, it's so important to just kind of believe in what you're doing. Um, you know, I always say you have to pay attention to what the present with intention for the future. Oh my and, God. You know, that's what it's yeah. really about. You are speaking my street when you say that dude, man, it is about the right now. And what is my intention today? Who am I going to reach and how am I going to get there? 
Yeah. I mean, you do it step by step. You know, you can only kind of connect the dots when you look backwards. But again, <laughs> it's, it's just taking those step, it's, it, it's taking those step by steps, man, one at a time. And, and, you know, suddenly, all of a sudden, when you look back, it all makes sense. It doesn't always make sense when you're trying to look forward at it. But again, that's why I said you can only pay attention to the steps that's in front of you. And, you know, you can you can know what you want to accomplish. There's this great quote by Jeff Bezos that says, be stubborn with your vision, but be flexible on the details. See, that's, and I'm a big believer in that. That's the very reason why I do a thing called a defrag journal in the way that I will sit there and ask myself the questions and then question the answers because I need to be in the presence of now. What is my plan? What is my purpose? What are the steps am I going to take? Don't try to predict the story. Live the story. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you got to go back and kind of break that down again. Yeah. And overthinking and, and just stress, it's, it's so easy to overcomplicate things. And, you know, I always kind of ask myself, what, what would it look like if this were easy? <laughs> you know, because we can make things hard and complex really quickly. But I force myself, I force my team to say, you know what? We can't boil the ocean. We can't do everything. We can't be all things to all people. But what would it look like if this were simple? And a lot of times the simple solution is more than enough. And even better, it's a lot less stressful. Mm -hmm. Melissa Mitchell, she is one of a billion, but yet she had the guts to look beyond that nine to five job while others are trapped. I believe that this one right here, this episode is going to change other people's lives. Yeah, you know, that's my hope. You know, Melissa has been a great friend. I've seen and watch her kind of build her, you know, her career and what she's been doing. I, I knew her when she used to work at Coca-Cola and corporate. Yeah. And again, just to see somebody, I mean, you know, she was making good money. She had a very safe career at a great company, but she knew she wanted a little bit more. And it's it's just so interesting because what she was doing at Coke is so far away from what she's doing now. And she felt like she always kind of had that in her. And so again, it just takes people that you need to have, to have those guts if you're willing to do it. I, I tell people all the time, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people out there that are a lot more stressed out because they're trying to run something well, they might be better as a number two or a number three or a number four in an organization. But if you really feel like you have it in you and you really feel like there's something more out there, I, I tell people all the time, like, why not go for it? You can always go back. You can always go find something else to do. But what I don't want to do, you know, when I, later on in life, is kind of look back with a bunch of regrets. And so I just love, you know, Melissa and her story because, you know, she did it and, you know, things kind of just started happening all of a sudden. You know, she was just doing the work and then an opportunity with, you know, Sarah Blakely with Spanx opened up and then she's doing TV commercials yep. and, you know, now she's got a whole line with she in. And so these things just happen because she had the guts to say, you know what, I want something more for my life. And, um, you know, again, looking back on it, I'm sure it all makes sense now. But I'm sure, you know, like she had to say, she had to kind of figure it out going along. And, mm -hmm. and that's what faith is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one of the things that you embrace tightly is the fact that you don't have to have a huge, huge team. Although Jay Carter has to have it during the festival season. But, he, but really, his team is what, seven or eight people? But then it's got to swell to several, you know, hundred more. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think people, you know, business is, is unique and it's really all about creativity and problem solving. And, you know, it's, there's no one size fits all formula. And for, the, you know, Jay and the team at One Music Fest, you know, they do an amazing event every year. Again, they bring out hundreds of thousands of people in Atlanta and now in Dallas and, and they got other things going on. And you would think that they have a massive team just around all year, but they don't. You know, when they're not doing the event, they scale down to just the core people that they kind of need. Um, but then, like he said, he brings in, you know, hundreds of volunteers and hundreds of part-time workers just for that event. And they, and they have a real formula over there through, I'm sure, trial and error and, and, and you know, lots of, you know, bumping their head along the way to where now they've kind of created this system and process. And that's the thing, man, you know, you know, you know, people fail, but systems don't. Mm. And when you really kind of start to figure out what that system is for your business, or that system is for your idea, one, it makes it a whole lot easier, but two, it takes a whole lot of stress off. You know, Jay tells a story in that podcast about in the early days, he was trying to do it all and holding on, holding on to everything yeah. himself. And yeah. that's a, yeah. a common thing I hear about with entrepreneurs is they want to do everything themselves because they have, but there's nothing more better than having a team. You know, one of the things I ask people is, you know, would you be okay if somebody could do something 70 or 80% as well as you could do it? You know, that last 20% might be your secret sauce that only you can do. But if I can get somebody that could do something 70 or 80% as well as I could do it. And I, and my, you know, my, I'm, I'm confident and, you know, confident enough to say, you know what, that's good. That works. Man, the amount of stress and the amount of stuff that takes off my plate is amazing. And I think that's one of those things that a lot of entrepreneurs have to learn over time is I need a team 
because I can't do everything myself. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, Jay has learned that lesson, but it's a lesson again that I've actually have started to notice too, that a lot of the people that we talk to talk about kind of that same, that same challenge of kind of being in this space of, you know, the idea is working, the business is working. Now what's important to me is, is consistently finding the right people to put on the field to make sure that this thing goes right. So I don't think a lot of people understand how important the team is once you get kind of outside the starting gate. Yeah. I want listeners to understand that this this isn't just about, you know, those that have had success or struggled through success. They themselves can become leaders in their own right. And you're very honest and transparent when you say, you know what, when you go to those business meetings, have a voice, speak up, do something, participate and become a leader. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're putting you in that room for a reason. Yes. And I think, you know, sometimes people people don't think they have a right to be in there. They don't think that they you know, should speak up. And again, why not? If you have an idea, you know, if you have an opportunity to say something, you never know who's listening. You never know if that idea might, you know, spark something else. Like that's the whole beauty of human interaction and conversations. It's two different ideas and two different perspectives coming together to make a new thing. And so it's important to not hold on to those things, you know, especially if they're providing value, especially if they're coming from a good place. You know, I tell people all the time, get out there and say what you got to say. You know, let it be known. Speak speak your mind. You know, people want you in these rooms for a reason. I have people on my team, and I encourage them to speak up. But I don't know everything. I know a lot of stuff, but I don't know everything, and I don't know what I don't know. And it's really important for me as a leader to put people around me that are smarter than me and better than me in other areas because that's the only way I get better. If I'm the smartest person here and I, and I know how to do everything, it's all going to be held with me. But if I can find people that are amazing at what they do, and bring them and make it and get them to buy into my vision and also understand what their goals are mm -hmm. and help them achieve what they want to achieve. It's not only a win-win situation, but it also helps me get closer to my goal while also helping them get closer to what they want to do. And it's not always about chasing the dollar. It's about getting the confidence as well as the experience in order to build your platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, look, look, money's important. Trust me. I, I know every month when I have to pay my power bill, <laughs> you know, and my, and my bills and stuff. Money's important, but it's really not everything. And and there's just a level of fulfillment that I think a lot of these people um, that are on butter knob, it's just people that want to build something in general are looking for. And like I said, one of the hard things is just figuring out, you know, what you want to do. Um, sometimes people want to turn, you know, a hobby into a full-time yeah. gig. And I say, well, maybe that's not the right thing because would you, would you enjoy it if you did it all day long? Like, you know, I, I enjoy playing ping pong, but I don't know if I want to be a, a, a professional <laughs> ping pong player. You know, I want to I want to have that moment to kind of get away from things. And so, you know, looking at those things, finding that inspiration um, and looking and seeing like how you can specifically kind of create and provide value is, is, is a big thing that I think more people need to kind of understand. And, and again, that's what we're trying to show on Butternomics is that there's a million ways not to get from point A to point Z, but just from point A to point D. And, you know, we want to just share that with people so they get inspiration because you never know. Somebody listens to that Jay Carter interview, mm -hmm. that Melissa Mitchell interview. They might not want to do that exact same thing, but that might inspire them to do something as well. And so you never know where that's going to come from. And hopefully people are hearing that stuff and they're saying, you know what? If they did it. Um, you know, they're a person just like me. And so I know it's possible. Let me go out here and give it my all. And, and, and try to create something amazing as well. Well, you know how people are, Brandon. They want things to be a very successful story right now. But Mache has a story here. She took her time to invest in a unique path. Yeah, you know, we, we live very much in kind of a microwave uh, time right now. I think, you know, I was, I was telling my daughter about this a couple of weeks ago where a lot of times um, we don't have as much patience because everything is accessible right now. You know, I'm gonna tell you, Errol, like when I grew up, if I wanted to watch The Simpsons, I had to wait till it came on. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go on, you know, the internet and go look up, not just The Simpsons, but any episode I wanted at any time. Now, all that stuff is at our fingertips. And so anything we want, any piece of information, um, any question that we have, any TV show, any song we wanna listen to, is all accessible from this thing we call our cell phone. Yep. But I don't come from that time. And I think what's happened over years is people have gotten used and they started applying that to other parts of their life and business. And that's the thing, man, this stuff isn't overnight. Um, you know, one thing I can say from building, you know, even my business is you never know what this thing is gonna be. And so it's important to kind of keep going out there and keep going. You know, I always tell this story about if you, if you, watch, if you watch somebody that knows how to juggle, if you really pay attention don't watch the hand that they throw with, watch the hand that they catch with. Oh, wow. Because if the hand that they catch with does not move, that means they're consistently throwing the ball the right way. 
And I think that just ties back into how you have to approach business. Just be consistent, consistently throw that ball, consistently get out there. And when you do that, man, things start to kind of happen. Wow. Where can people go to find out more about you, get some love from you, as well as learn more from you? I mean, the podcast is one level, but there is so much about you, Brandon, that we all need to learn. Absolutely. Well, I would tell everybody, please go look up Butternomics um, on iHeart, the iHeart app, or anywhere that you stream your podcast. We're on all platforms. And please go check us out and, and like, follow, and subscribe. As far as myself, um, you know, you can find us at ButterATL. That's butter dot, butteratl.com or butter.atl, butter.atl on Instagram. We're all over social media. We're all over the internet. I, I'm not a hard person to find. <laughs> please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Hey, thank you, Errol. I'm going to take you up on that. I hope to talk to you again soon. Absolutely, sir. You be brilliant, okay? Thanks. You too. Thank you. Hey, good morning, Errol. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. How are you? Great. Excellent. I got Caramel here standing by for you. Uh, do you happen to have an air date before I let you through? Tomorrow. Excellent. All right. Stand by. Thank you. All right, you're allowed to. You can say good morning. Hello and good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. How you doing? Absolutely blessed to have a conversation with you because you get it. And you're not afraid to teach it, share it, build upon it, and just, you know, let the world have something that they can have a positive vibe about. I appreciate that so much, sincerely. For you to be in this moment, that means that you have lived it. Therefore, you're saying, okay, if, if I've lived it and I have felt it, therefore other people need to do the same. How did you know when to cross that line? Um, I think I knew very early on. Really? I grew up in a household where I was taught that my story would be what would heal me if I didn't hide it, but also would help others to understand that they could achieve and be better. And so that was something that I knew from very early on. And so I knew that as long as I wasn't ashamed of my own personal growth, that it would always be a tool that I could use to make sure other people knew they weren't alone. And it has been sort of the guiding principle of how I deal with any person on my talk show, any person I ever come across. See, that explains every reason why I always feel like that watching your show is a reflection of everyday experiences. And, and, and that's why I tap in, because you're so in love with your community. It's not just about you. It's about the community. Yeah, it is definitely. I mean, we're, we're all on this planet spinning around. I mean, at some point we all have to realize that we're here to be here for each other. And I think that sometimes we can we can feel isolated. We can feel alone. We start to think that this experience is, you know, um, very isolating. And it's yeah. like, you have to remember, like, the thing that I'm going through, you're going through. The things that you're feeling, I'm feeling. And so we don't talk about it. That's what makes us feel like no one else gets me. And so the fact that we can take a moment to say, you know what, I'm going through it. I understand. It does help build that community and helps us all get stronger together. You know, one of the things that's great about you celebrating your third your third year on television with the daytime show is the fact that you've needed those other two seasons to be in this moment of now. And there's no way that what you're going to do this oh, season. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I mean, isn't that amazing how what we experience becomes tools for tomorrow? Listen, it's the best thing ever. What we experience becomes tools for tomorrow. Let me tell you something. I'm about to use that for uh, season three promo. You just wrote our season three promo. <laughs> uh, but no, um, it, it is great. It is great. And I'm actually, you know, every year, you know, since season one, it's like I, this is, this. I'm learning. I'm learning how to do this even better and better every year. It just keeps getting better. Um, you know, the mission of season three is to uh, resolve and evolve. Yeah. And that's for my guests is understanding, like, we're going to end this each show with resolving your issues. And we're going to give you that first step to teach you how to evolve to that next level. And I think that's an important step, especially in the genre of daytime talk I'm in. It's about, like, not only can you share the emotions, the raw things that are going on in your home, in your life, in your feelings, but also you're going to get some real tools to evolve and be better than this. One of the things that you've got is the fact that it's, you've always got your eye on uh, on those of us that are watching it. Because, I mean, I feel like that even when, when there's family squabbles on there, your heart is saying, okay, how can I learn from this so that my viewers can learn from it too and make sure that they, they have that connection of understanding? Yes, definitely. 100%. Yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah, yeah. Transparency. Oh, my God. How do you take that to the lens of a camera and, and feel great about being truthful in your faith? <sighs> 
I'm, I'm not ashamed of anything that I've been through or anything that I, I plan on going through. You know, I end these shows saying, let's keep talking and growing mm -hmm. because I think that's the only thing we can do on this earth. That's one of the things that we know is constant. You know, growth is inevitable in nature around us and it's also inevitable in each one of us. And the minute something stops growing is the minute that it ceases to exist. Yeah. And so for me, transparency comes in that growth. And so I will always be comfortable in being transparent because in that moment is where I learn or get a perspective or understand something about myself to grow and be better. Does this put you on a speaking tour? Because I mean, you know, TV has its its moments. You're you're fit within a certain time limit, but man, to hear you speak publicly would be one of the greatest experiences. Oh, you're you're kind. Yeah, I do do a little bit of a speaking tour, and so I'm actually thinking about planning a a nation tour for myself, just to kind of like do what I do on the Karamo show, where people can come. They come with their best friends, their family, you know, their partners and get some some advice and tools so they can do just that, that resolve and call, uh, you know, um, resolve and evolve. You know, one of the things that in three um, that we started in season two is we have um, Q and K yes. where my studio audience is get to just ask me any question and get advice from me. It could be about something singular or with their family. And so it's important for me to make sure that people know they always have access to me so that I can like. If I can help you, I'm always going to try. How do you embrace for that? Because you don't know what that next question is going to be. I mean, that's like on the spot. Let me tell you something. My granny used to tell me you got two ears <laughs> and you have one mouth, which means you're supposed to be doing one of those things double time, which is listening. And so what I've learned and one of my greatest skills is I'm an empathetic listener. So I'm always going to make sure that I'm listening to what they're saying and how they're moving, which allows me, no matter if it's on the spot, be able to give them real advice because I'm not giving generic advice. And this is something that I'm proud of myself. Like I don't have some sound bite to give to every person to say, this is for you. I don't believe in that. I believe what, when you're sharing with me, I need to listen and hear the nuances of what your experience has been and then give you advice based on you. And so that, that makes it easy for me because I'm not trying to fit everyone into some box of one piece of advice that I have. I'm trying to make sure that my advice fits you. Are you a daily writer? Because in watching the show and hearing you speak, it, it's almost like you're always in the in the mode of "I am here to receive." When I receive, I share. Oof. Are you a writer? Because this is now number two. <laughs> Everything that comes out of your mouth is poetic and beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I do write. I write daily. Um, I'm also a big reader. I love to read. I mean, like I start my mornings. You know, I'm of the generation that still that, you know, used to buy magazines and papers like I'm 43 years old. So I like to read a lot. And I think reading and writing allow me, but not just like news. I also read a lot of poetry. I read things that um, medical journals, science journals. And I think the more that I can just keep my mind um, understanding what the human experience is. It just allows me to keep myself open to the world. It allows me to keep myself in a space where I'm just always understanding how to receive and give back. Yeah. From one broadcaster to another, how are you keeping that voice healthy? Because you talk a lot. I mean, because I mean, what, what is your secret of sounding so <laughs> dynamic? There's a lot of Coca-Cola. This is my, <laughs> my dirty habit. My dirty habit. If it can clean a, a car battery, it's going to help my pipes. And so it's my one thing that I should stop doing. I don't have any other vices like that, but I love, you know, two cans of Coca-Cola throughout the day. And so i got to do better. How do, you, how do you keep your composure in the way of your – there are so many of your stories that, that really very pull on my heartstrings as a viewer. And one of the reasons why I left television was because I let my emotions go through my eyes. How do you keep – your composure you know in the moment i'm so focused on someone else's healing and their okay. journey that it, it uh, you know it's weird because it's it's like when i'm in front of my studio audience often i don't see them anymore or hear them it's it's a very weird experience once i'm locked in and listening to someone i can't hear anybody else yeah i'm so in tune with what they're saying that like my audience is in, in front of me and I don't see them or hear them anymore, that it allows me in that moment to, to be so focused that I'm not focused on my own emotions. But I will tell you this, there's often when I get home and now I've had a, time, a moment to reflect on someone's pain mm -hmm. that has you know resolved into some evolution of them being better and that will make me emotional and so it's usually after because in the moment i'm just so focused on them and hearing what they're saying 
that it allows me not to be emotional. But often, many times afterwards, I'll be like, I'll tell you this, I'll see a clip and I'll start crying our own clip yep. where in the moment I didn't cry, but later on I'll be crying. Wow, wow. See, it's those after moments that I love to study. I love to learn from because I call that post-production blues that a lot of people do not see us when the microphones yep. are off. And it's like, so we have to regain control. Exactly. You know it, you know it, you know it. Yeah. I mean, like we, we put our hearts on our sleeves. We're in the moment. And so once you get back and you're really watching it back, you know, you things emotions and, and 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 feelings and triggers pop up and so you have to know how to manage that and so luckily for myself i'm able to manage that hopefully you were able to manage yeah. that hopefully you have people that you can ask for advice for you know ask for support you know that's one of my biggest things that i always tell people like don't be afraid to ask for help i think that we're in a space where if you're afraid to ask for help you'll find yourself in those post moments of life period no matter where you're at finding yourself again feeling alone feeling as if like no one can understand. And I think it's important for us always to remember to ask for help and know that people are out there who want to help you. God, I love where your heart is. I love where your heart is. Where can people go to find out more about Thanks you and this. everything you do so they can share some love with you? Sure. You know, like, um, so they can go to karamoshow.com, um, karamoshow.com, because they can find out where Karamo Show, we're nationally syndicated, so we play all over the yeah. country. Um, you know, we also play on Bounce, E, Bravo, so people can tune in. Um, and also there's links there to all my social media so that they can follow me and follow my journey. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Any time. <laughs> Listen, you you have been, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who are like a student. I'm taking notes on everything you have said. So you are pretty, pretty phenomenal. I will come back and learn from you anytime <laughs> you will have me. Will you be brilliant then, okay? All right, brother, you too. Thank you. Have a good one, man. Hello? Hey, how are you doing today, John? I'm all right. How you doing? Absolutely fantastic. Dude, we got to talk about this album, Light em, Light em Up. My God, you guys embrace real rock and you push us forward. That's cool, man. Thank you. So obviously you've heard the whole record. I have, and we're going to talk about every song if you don't mind. Oh, okay, okay. And, and just please forgive me. I, I'm literally going from like interview to interview to interview to interview like so who am i speaking with now my name is arrow i've been with you so many times in fact i've i've had conversations with the dead daisies all the way back sir so it, it's a it, it, i've always embraced what you guys have done and continue to do all right awesome buddy thank you first of all let's let's start off with a single i'm gonna ride you talk about an anthem here i mean i realize it's about you know dropping our worries and stresses but this is an open road song yeah that's you know again i ride so it's one of those things if you ride a motorcycle you know you kind of got to be really super aware of everything that's going on around you and um unfortunately people don't pay much mind to people on bikes but um, it really is one of those things. There, it, there's something about riding a bike. Like if if you if you're having stress or your boss is giving you crap or your wife or whatever, you can just get on a bike for like, you know, whether it's thirty minutes or thirty days. <laughs> you know, it's just wind in your hair. No, no real destination in mind. Just ride. And then, you know, once you get home, your head is clear and you're ready to tackle the world again. Is that, but, the, uh, is that the reason why the, the songs have that rhythm to it? Because I, 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 it feels like that it's an engine. The speed of each and every song has its own kind of a, a source of speed to it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you know, for me, when I'm when we write. It, it, it's it's weird because a lot of people ask me, uh, like personally how i write songs do i write the lyrics first and then the music to that or do i write the you know and for me it's always worked in a manner where i listen to the music and i just kind of get a vibe i it, it's the weirdest thing like i'll literally be listening to the song the page is blank mm -hmm. and i listen to the song and then all of a sudden i just start seeing like it's almost like uh you know, storyboards for a movie or vignettes from a video. Do you know what I mean? Like, I just start seeing things. And then it's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's what I want to write it about. 
I had that feeling, that vibe, because I had started working on that song when I was out of the Daisies. Wow. And uh, oddly enough, I worked on it with uh, Keith Nelson, who used to be in Buck Cherry. Now he's like, a, you know, he's got his own studio. He's a producer and songwriter. And so I started working on it with him and I came home and I just put music down. I didn't have any lyrics. I didn't have, uh, the song was a bit different, but I listened to it and I called him. I said, hey dude, I think I'm gonna just write this song about riding a bike. <laughs> and he goes, okay, cause he rides as well. He goes, well, what are you gonna call it? And I was like, initially I was just like, ride. Yeah. But, um, then we looked at it. I showed it to Marty. I put it in Dropbox folder when we started working on this record. It wasn't finished. And we definitely altered the song quite a bit. But, um, you know, took parts out, added things, did all this other stuff. And and then uh, when I told Marty what I wanted to write it about, um, I sat down and worked on the lyrics with Marty. And we called it I'm Gonna Ride. And uh, again, it's just, you know, we're inundated 24 hours a day, seven days a week with bad news yep. and just TV and just all this garbage. So I, you know, we just said, you know what, dude, let's make it about clearing your head and just getting out of a, just getting out of the, or getting away from the stress or the, you know, everyday mundane shit that drives us all crazy. So um, that's what we wrote it about. Just clearing your head and getting out on the road with no destination in mind. When you talk about building a song like this, all of a sudden it reminds me of the song Times Are Changing because the way that the song builds up, my heart is going, here comes the vocals. God, I oh, here they come, here they come. And then all of a sudden you start singing it and it all comes together as a solid tune. But I mean, I love the song Times Are Changing. That's, you know, and I, I got to credit where credit is due. That was something that Marty actually put in the Dropbox folder. Wow. And he was like, hey, guys, I wrote this song. He wrote it with somebody else or he wrote it like and never used it. Hmm. And he always thought the song was great. And we listened to it and our, we were all sitting there and our manager and he's like, dude, you know, even our manager said it with the way things are nowadays, politically, racially, religiously. Like, he's like, that's perfect. It's a great song. And we were all like, yeah. You know, and then you get like Doug Aldridge in there doing his stuff on guitar and then change the key a little bit for me, for vocally. And uh, it's just a great song. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that one was, uh, that it, it is, it's, it's another cool song, you know, that we were just like, man, this, this thing kicks, kicks ass. And lyrically, it's pretty relevant to a lot of stuff that's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. When when you when are you guys sitting in the same room when you're building these songs? Because I I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when you were putting together "I Want to Be Your Bitch." Because there, there's a uniqueness about this song that I know that the new age of classic rock has got to be jumping on because they're opening up the door for people just like the Dead Daisies. Yeah, you know, and 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 that's the thing about the Daisies. First of all, we've always done our records are really quick. Yeah. But again, every other band that I was in, there was maybe like one or two writers. Do you know what I mean? Whatever. But this thing, it's it's weird. Like, even with guys like, you know, in the past, we had Dean and Brian Tish. Everybody writes. Yeah. So what we do is we'll normally get together. We've got a Dropbox folder. We start pulling ideas out of the folder. And then we're all set up in a room, drums, bass, guitars are blaring. Uh, you know, I'm screaming in the corner. Marty's there. He's yelling things. We're all yelling stuff. And, you know, like when I say yelling, we're just throwing yeah, ideas yeah. out there to see what sticks. And the songs come together really quickly. Uh, you know, and so historically, every studio record that the Daisies have done that I was involved in, we did it in a month or less. Wow. And this one, oddly enough, is even cooler. Like we did, uh, we actually did 
two records in 29 days this time. Um, so we did what was light them up, but part of the process was we came here to Nashville. We started writing and recording here, and then we all crossed the bucket list thing off of our our list. <laughs> And we packed up and we went south to the legendary studio, uh, Fame Studios in Muscle Shoals. Oh my God. Wow. Where that whole Muscle Shoals thing started. Yeah. And we were down there for maybe uh, eight days, nine days, something like that. And then we came back and finished at Marty's again. But we went down there and while we were there, we recorded Light 'em Up during the day about 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, we would take a break, eat dinner, we'd have our Jameson, or our wine, vodka, whatever. And then we'd just get back to work and we started jamming. And we kind of, in the process, we were doing like all these, like just cool jam songs, like, uh, but blues. Yeah. yeah. So we were like, you know what? Fuck it, let's, <laughs> let's record this. And we literally recorded 10 classic standard blues songs. Wow. wow. Is that and the And then we went back to Nashville and we finished Light 'em Up, you know? So um, we did uh, we did Light 'em Up, wrote it, recorded it, mixed it, and mastered it. And the blues, we didn't write the songs, but we rearranged them and we did do some writing on it. Mm -hmm. um, but we recorded mixed and mastered an entire blues album as well God. now is that the reason why i keep hitting repeat on these songs because you guys didn't sit there and do it again do it again do it again do it again because it's so fresh to hear well you know so what we do what we do like when when i say we're in the room bashing ideas out i call i call it making a map yep so what we'll do is we'll we'll kind of figure out like okay that's the beginning there's the verse there's the chorus a bridge or a solo whatever and then there's the last chorus and there's the ending so we get a map together and then once we've all agreed marty included okay I, that that sounds pretty good then what we'll do is we'll just go in and like I'm kind of scatting, I have no lyrics, but I'm just kind of scatting yeah. the vocal. And we'll go in and we'll lay down like three, four takes of each song, wow. but it's live off the floor. Gee, that, that's, I see. And then we save those and then Marty will listen back to them and go, I really like take three on this one or take one on that one. And, whatever and then then we start building on that take and when i say building it's normally just doug doing his guitar solos <laughs> and then i just go off into a room and i just close my eyes and listen to the track and start writing lyrics uh you know and then and then at which point like then now this time the guys actually left and went back to their, you know, respectable homes or whatever. And I stayed and just started singing all the songs with Marty. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I but, do. But uh, we did both records, dude, in 29 days. God. God. How did you put the special effects of making it sound like that it really goes back in time when it, with the song Back to Zero? Because I really feel like that we're going back. You've, you've got that vibe in there. Back to Zero is funny, man. It's just... It was a riff that Doug had. Doug had that riff from the chorus. Uh, I don't know, if, you know, the chorus, if you want to call it a chorus, whatever. The chorus part of that, Doug had the riff, and then we just started jamming it again. Came up with a map. And then back to zero is just a phrase that my wife and I use. And I, I think if you're in a relationship or married, you'll understand what mm -hmm. I'm talking about. But, you know, in the beginning of a relationship, you meet a girl and you're like, oh my God, it's so fun. You can't wait to see her. Like your car can't get go fast enough to get to her house. The sex is awesome, you know, but the longer the relationship goes, 
then life starts creeping in. Oh, sh- I got to pay these bills. <laughs> I, you know, she's got to take the kids to school. You know, there's like, oh, we're, you know, whatever. It could be something simple as far as like making dinner or cleaning the house. Life creeps in. And my wife and I have a phrase that we use to each other. Like every time I get home from tour, I have a, I have a motor home and pack it up with my dogs, my wife, we load it up and we'll just go somewhere. Yep. And it's just her and I checking out, no phones, don't want, I tell her, even my managers, I I go, I'm going away with my wife, don't call me. And, you know, we we have two phrases. We either use, we're gonna hit the reset button (laughs) or we're taking it back to zero. Nice. So the song really is about, okay, God, like this is all this shit is getting in the way. Like, let me take it back to zero. That's why I say woman, woman, take me, take me right back to zero. Do you know what I mean? And it's just about, it's just about uh, checking out of life, checking out of life for a minute and just taking your significant other out on whatever date night date week date month whatever and just hit and reset yeah yeah john you got to come back to this show anytime in the future the door is always going to be open for you thank you buddy well congratulations on this brilliant album man and i cannot wait to see you guys live as you hit the road yeah we're we're actually oddly enough i'm leaving monday uh, heading to the UK. Uh, we're going to hang out over there for a couple of days, do some rehearsing because we haven't seen each other for a bit. So we're going to rehearse for a couple of days and then we kick off our UK tour on the 6th. The album comes out the 6th, light them up and then uh, take a little break. And then we're back over to Europe in November, right up to the holidays. And, uh, and then, uh, and then it's happy new year. 2025 onward and upward i love it will you be brilliant today okay sir i'll try thank you thank you so much All right. hello and good morning everybody hi arrow <laughs> are you finished with the other interview yeah i was talking with john karabi from the uh, dead daisies he's, he's he's one of those rock stars Oh, okay. I've never heard of the Dead Daisy. Oh, you'd like him? I'm if you, sure you. If you like some you good were rock, awesome and he was too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I'm more of the jazz lady. Okay. Now that I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love me some jazz too because to me, that's where funk music is right now. Is in jazz. Yeah, yeah. Have, do you know who Brian Culberson is? Sure, I do. Oh my God! I've seen him like <laughs> twice. Oh, I'll follow that man to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let's see. Let's get down to business. So this will be aired. I have it. Let me look at my program log. I should always have it up here. The okay. Here comes my program log. I've got it. Saturday the thirty first. Uh. Okay, oh eight three one. I'm yep. getting confused. Today today has been the morning from hell. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to thank you for rearranging your schedule for us. That means a lot. Thank you so much. Carol. Absolutely, man. That's what teamwork is all about. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Hold on just a second. Let's see if she's ready. And you can have a full 10 minutes and over if you like a little bit. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you so much. All right. She's ready. Have a great interview. If I don't talk to you, have a great Same uh, to you. Labor Day. Yeah, and uh, go Chiefs. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> and Arrow has joined. Hello and good morning. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Absolutely fantastic and very excited to talk with you because you embrace animals and one that, that that is such my life and and i just i love the way that you're able to write about them to share stories to bring things together it, it's your, your heart is in the right place thank you thank you thank you yeah i have i have loved writing these animal stories it's been really great to sort of sink into an ecosystem and go okay if i was what would i what would i notice if i was an animal what would i be smelling what would i be hearing what would i be paying attention to 
right? Because it's not always what I'm paying attention to as a human, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, it's it's been great fun to write. See, I understand that vision because I will do the same thing when it comes to, you know, being out here in this forest that I live in with a copperhead snake. What is that copperhead snake doing? Why this place? What's going on? And so I do, I become them. And I don't know if that's because of the martial artist in me, but I want to be them to see what the human is doing to them. Yeah, Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, and just and I love it too when my animal characters come across a thing they've never encountered before. Yep. And and asking myself, what do what would they think that thing is? Because everybody understands a new thing in relation to the things that they already know. And so yeah, that's a really fun connection to make and and um and helping kids make those leaps of inference too. You know, because my readers are pretty young, so that's their at the beginning of that game, and that's all exciting. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you said that that your readers are young because I, while while I was reading the book, I really said to my wife, I wish my third grade teacher, Mrs. Stephenson, was here so that she could read this book to me because I it's it's that's that kind of a story. Hmm. Yeah, I really love read aloud ability. I read my work out loud all the time. Um, first of all, I will never see the mistakes that I've made. I, I'm much better at hearing the mistakes than seeing it. And um, but um, but I really want that to be a satisfying reading out loud experience because just because a book is good doesn't mean it really works out loud. But that that reading time in a classroom and in a family, it's precious. Mm-hmm. I think the over the years being read to in school that is all told from kindergarten through the end of sixth grade that's about 500 hours and it is the best writing instruction i have ever received Hmm. truly that that reading aloud in grade school the book we're talking about is a horse named sky how did this book come to you and how did you maintain the discipline in order to bring this book all the way to its final page well i was you know my entire ambition as a third grader was to become a pony express rider myself nice you know i mean outside all day going fast excellent pay very little supervision what's not to like right and so um so when i dug into the pony express a little bit more at the beginning of my research process i learned that the pony express for the flat sections of the of the pony express trail in the east they just took racehorses out of tennessee and kentucky but um, those horses just couldn't hack the mountains at all. Mm. But Mustangs are so tough, man. They're just, they're cold hardy. They can, they can run at altitude. They are so fast. Their hooves are really healthy and strong, so they don't need to be shod. And, um, and they're smart. They're yeah. just really smart about um, the hazards that are actually there. And so they were a natural choice for the Pony Express. So they took Mustangs off the range to run across the Rockies and over the Sierra Nevada. When you talk about so the Mustangs, when, 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 when you talk about the Mustangs, I mean, I'm from Montana, and the, the prior mountains were where the wild Mustangs were. Did you visit that area? How did you get so close to the Mustangs? Well, I wasn't able to go to the prior range, but I did in eastern Oregon on the Steens Mountain Wilderness. There have been wild horses there for hundreds of years, actually, wow. and um, uh, it's amazing, and it's very remote. I mean, where I was looking at horses, we were like 50 or 60 miles from a gas station, <laughs> so this is very empty country out there, and, um, but the great thing is that there's plenty of room for wild horses mm-hmm. out there, Um and so I, I had an opportunity to see them. It was during the pandemic, so I was camping in my little research van. <laughs> and I just remember the sun coming up, and we had uh, camped not far from a water hole. And so, you know, that beautiful rising sun, and then these bands of horses, they just they just appeared <laughs> out of the mist of the morning, coming down to the water to drink. And they're very deferential to each other, you know. They don't really want conflict, and so each... Each horse, um, each band comes as a group in turn, and they wait for each other. It was amazing to see. Yeah. I study Native American spirituality, and which means I study all animals. And I had to do some research on horses. And they represent an unexpected adventure in time to free yourself physically as well as emotionally. And that's what you just said. You, you said as they came in there as one big family, they left as the family as well. They love each other, and they love to be free. Yeah. Yeah, their bonds to each other uh, are really um, 
are really beautiful to see. And and I like I remember seeing a, a stallion with his group of mares, and then there was a bachelor band of uh, young stallions nearby. And they were starting to, you know, talk trash to each other. Then they did a little kicking the dirt. But as soon as one of them reared up and started punching at another horse, mm. that big stallion, was like, he just fixed those young horses with a stare. He didn't even say anything. And you would <laughs> I've been caught smoking behind the gym. <laughs> like, what, fight us? No, we're all just grazing here. It was done in a heartbeat. It was amazing. To see that kind of um, communication and connectedness and respect, it was, yeah, it was very, um, not what I was expecting at all. Wow. Um, but, yeah, they're very, um, they're such expressive animals, horses. It's, it was fascinating to watch them. I experienced that with the deer that live in this forest. We have about nine deer, and, and when, when the bucks come walking in, I love to sit there and just stare at them and to watch their, their body movement. So for you to experience these horses, I just can't imagine what it was doing to your heart because it's, it's almost like they're communicating to us as well. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're inspiring and they're so beautiful. And can you even imagine our history without horses? Oh, Where no. would we be? Mm-mm. No, no, no. <laughs> Mm-mm. So, um, yeah, I feel like we owe them some uh, some time and space on the range there. I keep waiting for CBS to approach you to take your stories of animals and give it give you a Sunday morning show. Because, I mean, the way that you share these stories is the way we learn to better understand the animals. It's not so scientific. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I had, I've had some interesting conversations with... Um, biologists talking mm-hmm. about that very question about what is it, what can we know about animals? And and there are good reasons not to personify animals when you're doing research on them. But many of these researchers have also said, although personifying animals has its risks, denying animals um, intellect and emotion that we would and motivation that we would prefer to reserve for ourselves mm. is equally problematic, right? And so, um, so I try and and give them that full range of of social um, development there when I'm writing about them. Now you've written about whales. You've written about the wolf, which mm-hmm. which uh, I just love the wolf. What what what's in your future plans? Well, the next book up is going to be called A Wolf Called Fire, and it is about one brother. I've gotten so many lovely letters from children who are like, what about Wander's brother? He loved his <laughs> <laughs> And so I got to thinking, we've learned some, some things about how the leadership of wolf packs goes, right? Wolf, wolves are very dynamic animals, and... And the leadership of a pack changes over pretty regularly. But there isn't one way to be the leader of a pack. There isn't only one leadership style. And so this book gave me an opportunity to show how a wolf who isn't the biggest or the fastest wolf in the pack, how he finds his own way to becoming a leader when he's left behind with, um, with the pups of his, wow. his home pack. I love the so idea. That was really- I love the idea that you've got such a connection with your readers that you allow them to reach out to you. Yeah, I love the letters I get from kids. It's pretty inspiring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because in, in reality, I mean, you could be that author that gets them to pick up a writing instrument to share their own stories. We all have art authors that really gave us that inspiration. Yeah. Well, and something that I tell kids all the time, too, is that in 1973, when I'm about the age of my reader now, the United States passed the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Protection Act, which makes it illegal to hunt horses. It makes it illegal to sell their bodies for dog food and and provides them a number of protections under law. That law did not have any constituency advocating for it except for children. Mm -hmm. Wild Horse Annie wrote a bunch of... And, you know, op-ed things in a newspaper, but she only ever heard from children. So she went around from school to school and talked to children, and thousands and thousands of children wrote to their members of Congress, their governors, the Department of the Interior, saying, 
wild horses deserve our protection. And so it is the only law that I know of that was passed almost entirely on the advocacy of children. And so something that I always tell children when I talk to them is writing is the most power you can have. Mm. Right? It's more power. It's going to be a while before they vote, but there is power in writing, and the writing of children changed the laws of this country. And that, I think, is really important. Wow. I want them to have that power. I want them to use it wisely. And, and so um, whether they become authors or not, everybody needs to write. Yep, <laughs> and for most people, what they write down is the most power they will have in their so life. So true. Where can people go to find out more about you, to find out about all your books, and really to tap into your energy so they can give you some love? <laughs> awesome. I have a website. It's roseanneperry.com. Um, I'm on Instagram sometimes, um, and um, also just Roseanne.perry. And um, and also children write to me at Annie Bloom's bookstore as well, which is where I work. It's my neighborhood independent bookstore. And so um, if they want to send me an actual paper letter, that's a good way to go. I Annie Bloom's it. bookstore. I love it. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Roseanne. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, Earl. You take care. Thank you. 